Hi, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this session on uh, what uh, we have uh, framed as a, a conversation on geotech, which is basically the conflation of global politics, global economic, global trade, and how it's playing out in the technology arena, or rather how technology is implicating global trade, global politics, and global economics. Um, uh, with me uh, this afternoon, uh, to my immediate uh, left, is uh, Khalid Al Ali, who's uh, the former executive director at NASA, a scientist, someone who's uh, keenly followed Silicon Valley, is now part of the America uh, Qatar Institute on the leadership board, uh, an entrepreneur and an investor. And he knows a thing or two about technology and we're gonna be asking you, sir, how this region is responding to some of the global dynamics uh, uh, of the sector. Uh, to his left is Rachel Rizzo, who I would claim is uh, the brightest mind in the US and now in Berlin. And uh, she's going to talk to, uh, talk to us about the Mercedes versus 5G trade-off that uh, the Germans seem to be grappling with. And of course, uh, the perceived American relative decline uh, when it comes to technology offerings. And finally, Professor Wong Dong, a very old friend of mine from the Peking University, wears multiple hats, international studies, runs the America China Institute, the deputy executive dean there, and uh, has been trying to create the people-to-people -people contact between America and China. And I'm going to ask him how is technology helping him do his job. But Professor Wong, uh, welcome to this uh, forum this afternoon, and I'm going to provoke you. This is not my position. It's my job to make sure that the conversation is interesting. So my first question will be to you, Professor Wong. People claim, people rather, uh, be, some claim, not all of them, that the Chinese technology offerings today are implicating and impacting global arrangements around trade and economics, around human rights and uh, personal spaces, freedom of expression, and in fact, they are beginning to strengthen hands of regimes that are not necessarily democratic and liberal. The idea here is that the digital belt and road is actually a political tool use, that uses technology and finance to uh, help China expand its influence. And I want you to comment on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Samia. First of all, before uh, answering your very uh, provocative question, uh, let me say thank you, uh, Samia, uh, and also the organizer for inviting me to uh, uh, the Doha Forum. I, over the last, uh, yesterday and today, I've learned uh, tremendously uh, from uh, the, the, the various of conversations. Um, and uh, um, I would say the question I think you pose, I think actually, it seems to me less provocative than provocative than the many questions a lot of uh, our speakers uh, they were you know being under scrutinized. Uh, so I feel for that I'm very grateful uh, uh, for you, uh, Samuel. Uh, you know I think technology in, in itself we all understand it has a lot of very important implications for uh, economics uh, and uh, uh, politics and uh, and and security uh, and in a way. I think uh, how uh, technology is being uh, used, my understanding is that the overall uh, theme of this uh, panel is really how the geopolitical dimension of technology is affecting us uh, uh, nowadays. Um, and uh, your question is, I think, uh, uh, is a very uh, interesting question. I think my understanding is that technology is, uh, is actually neutral. Right? So how technology is being used usually uh, is governed by a set of uh, policy frameworks that's in a domestic context. And then if you move up to the international context, then you would have like a multilateral sort of uh, arrangements uh, or uh, some sort of uh, governance uh, uh, regimes, et cetera, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with that. Um, and I uh, have to also uh, to uh, just note that uh, a lot of those, uh, the, the, my understanding, the criticism, uh, you know, uh, uh, against China, I think is also, uh, is a bit of a misrepresented or misinterpreted uh, uh, in a way that I think we need to sort of take off that ideological, uh, ideological um, uh, 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 lens, which I believe is not very uh, uh, constructive or helpful for uh, engaging in uh, a, a set of uh, 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 conversation because if we come in with the presumed uh, ideological assumptions, then that, that 
I think will damage the basis for uh, for our dialogue. So, so I would say that uh, you know it's it must be uh, uh, just like you know we have uh, cell phones, many other any other technology products. Uh, we produce knives. You you buy knife. People can use that. Terrorists can use that to to inflict violence against innocent people. Then you say, oh, anyone who manufacturing this knife should be condemned. It's very hard to to make that kind of allegation. I'm so I'm just using this very simple analogous way to to highlight. I think how this conversation needs to be. Uh, put into a more but more recently, let me let uh, fair enough. Uh, right. Technology is neutral, and you are suggesting that China's technology exports has very little right. to do with the politics of right. how of the users. Let me ask you a more direct question. Most recently, you saw the exchange between Germany and China. Your own diplomat in Berlin has actually threatened the German parliamentarians that if you don't allow Chinese 5G technology, we are going to uh, probably not buy the Mercedes Benz that we do in 300,000 numbers each year. Now, this is direct diplomatic uh, influence exertion uh, and a state promoting uh, a market offering uh, rather uh, aggressively. You mean the uh, United States, my understanding of your question is the United States putting pressure on its allies like Germany, right, to ban uh, the, the Huawei sort of 5G technology. And the Chinese uh, putting pressure on Germany to, uh, you know, yeah. to do exactly the opposite. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, so this is a very typical scenario in which when politics gets into uh, 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 technology, right, and, uh, and then uh, I think the uh, business of course, uh, naturally, we'll be left with uh, uh, little options, you know, how to deal with that. But, you know, the, the cases you, you brought up actually is fascinating because it pr precisely highlights uh, the, some ironic aspect of that because it, German, Germany, being one of the closest allies of the United States, actually does not share the American threat perception of China. And, and, and it's all on the press, so, so everyone knows that you've got senior uh, American officials, you know, went to lecture Germany about how to handle its national security. It really hurts uh, German dignity, right? You've got senior German leaders, politicians fight back. So, 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 so I think uh, if from uh, outside or objective sort of scholar point of view, then it begs the question that whether or not there's uh, really a uh, political side uh, or politicizing, over politicizing of this issue uh, by the United States, by the American side. I think this is a question that I think the, uh, our American uh, colleagues, American uh, uh, policymakers really have to bear in, mind, uh, bear in mind. Instead of forcing its allies and then sort of uh, creating uh, a divided, you know, a di very divisive uh, uh, policy and forcing its allies to choose sides uh, 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 because the bottom line is that the United States has failed to present any whatsoever evidence uh, in support of its allegation, accusation against Huawei technology. You know, it's all based on sort of speculation. And then, naturally, it's allies like Germany, UK, France will come up. You know, come on, we are not kids, right? Not boys that you come over and lecture us and, uh, you know, do this and not do this and do that. And, 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 and this is a, a thing I think the American policymakers really have to think hard about what's really went wrong in their policy approach. Uh, I'm going to come back to you with a question on um, the allegations a little later, the allegation that China is exporting surveillance tech for regimes to control their citizens like China controls its own. I'm going to come think about this uh, allegation and I'll come back to you. Rachel, why should you be bullying the Europeans into choosing sides? What is it that the Americans bring to the table? Do you have your own 5G solution that's on offer, and yet you deny people access to technology? Well, the short answer to the question is no, not yet, but the hope is that we will have our own 5G solution at some point. Um, but I think it's important to take a couple steps back here um, and ask, you know, why are we here and how, and how do we get to this debate? I mean, for me, as an American living in, in Europe, this is absolutely at the center of every foreign policy discussion, every expert roundtable. Um, and Europe is really in a pressure cooker right now because, as Professor Wong said, um, it is being pulled in multiple directions. You have direct 
um, political pressure being placed on the Europeans by some of the top diplomats in the United States. Um, you know, Secretary Pompeo, for example, just wrote a big uh, uh, op-ed in Politico. Uh, pushing back on the Europeans, saying that they shouldn't let Chinese um, 5G technology into the country or into the continent for, for various reasons. Um, and so I think we need to ask why we're here and how we got here. Um, you know, Huawei is not new to Europe. Huawei has been in, in Europe for, for 20 years, and pretty much every country has at least one mobile network that is Huawei-based. Um, we're here because... Uh, the West, namely the United States, um, had a huge strategic error five to ten years ago in completely underestimating the power of 5G. And so now we find ourselves at a crossroads where we don't have the technology ourselves, but and, and China does, and, and we don't want our allies to, to, to have that technology for you know, various security reasons. Um, so going forward, I think uh, there's a few questions we have to ask. Um, you know, Europe itself doesn't have uh, a united vision on this. Forget the vision with the United States. Europe itself is completely divided in how to, in how to approach this. So I think going forward, it's important for Europeans to come up with a united vision. And I, unfortunately, I don't necessarily see that happening. Um, and so then you get into the question of uh, a Huawei ban and the fact that it would be fragmented. And a fragmented ban is basically the same as no ban at all. Um, and, and then, you know, going one step deeper, you know, what is it that the United States uh, is n nervous about, right? Is it, um, uh, like, obviously, you know, surveillance technology and, and you know, back doors, but is, the, you know, we also come into this issue of, like, th these are legacy systems and there are some no, but let me, vulnerabilities. Let, let me interrupt you there, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Europe is, or rather, the Western technologies, yeah. Western companies were yeah. the original exporters of surveillance technology. Yeah. NSA did not happen based on Huawei, yeah. right? It was Western technologies that began this culture of surveillance, sure. yeah. of eavesdropping, of snooping, of collecting data, of using data. So uh, let's assume that Chinese are doing the same thing. Why is it that, the, uh, that suddenly we see a new morality dawn on the Western world around uh, these technologies? I mean, I think what it comes down to is this vision of of different kinds of different kinds of technology, right? There's sort of these two conceptions of what the digital space is supposed to look like: this sort of cosmopolitan Western one and this sovereign sovereignty based one, which is more of a Chinese vision. Um, and and you know, the the strong sovereignty approach is basically this reaction to this idea that you know non-Western states are. Uh, are, are writing the rules, and it's just basically American imperialism <laughs> masquerading as globalism, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it isn't just China that is, is creating issues here. It is the United States as well, I think. And so these are uh, big questions that we need to answer. And I think the United States needs to understand as well that you can't use bans on things like Huawei or ZTE to reform um, the current model of the domestic political economic system, right? Which I think is, is, is a, some people think that, that that might be something that can happen. And so, yeah. So let me ask you one more question. Sure. Very recently, you have started hearing about information security as a term um, that uh, Western countries have begun to deploy. If you were to look at uh, the BRICS document on cybersecurity from, uh, say, five, seven, eight years ago, the BRICS always spoke about information security. They spoke about protecting uh, citizens from external propaganda and news and influence. This has now begun, this debate has begun in the West as well with the elections, um, interference, alleged interference. Yeah. Um, do you think that at the end of the current cycle of debate, you will see far greater convergence between the West and China in state having a dominant role in managing content? Well, this is one of the biggest questions that's facing the United States right now. And um, I mean, we have experienced this at, at a massive scale um, where, you know, no regulation, uh, free internet, uh, free flow of information is good 
to an extent because we've seen what that looks like. And in, 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 in 2016, malicious actors were able to use that to their advantage and spread, you know, things like malicious information, disinformation, and, you know, it, it had a, an effect in the outcome of our political system, right? And so I do think you are going to see more state level, uh, um, more state level di discussions on what the state's role is in regulation, and that's something that we're, we're working through right now in the United States. Excellent. Uh, Colin, let me come to you. Um, and, and let me give you, uh, in a sense, um, a small uh, perspective from India, and maybe even from the African continent where we host uh, a technology gathering each year, my institute, which is uh, privileged to partner with the Doha Forum to curate this session. In, in India, in Africa, there is great optimism around technology. We see technology as something that could really transform our um, e economic uh, prospects. Uh, e youth, um, entrepreneurs are for the first time being able to uh, produce business models, uh, are being able to create wealth, are being able to create jobs. And there is a general greater degree of optimism around technology in Asia, in, in, in Africa, than there is in, say, Europe uh, or the US. Uh, sitting in Qatar, where you do, uh, how do you navigate these two or three different um, currents around technology? One, which is tech optimism, which you see in Africa, uh, even in the GCC countries. Uh, many GCC countries are investing a lot in the knowledge age, in the fourth IR, in the digital. Then you see uh, the tensions between China and the US in terms of trade and geopolitics. And then you see the European model, where there is an obsession with individual rights and space. How does Qatar locate itself in this swirl of different technology currents uh, that flow through this region? Well, first, um, <clears throat> I like, Samir, how you've uh, placed Qatar exactly where, I, where I'd like to see it, which is um, where the new center of gravity of the world is going to be linking east with west. So uh, to look at Qatar as the hub that connects everyone mm -hmm. with everyone is a model I like, I, I like talking about a lot. So. Um, uh, so that's a great perspective. Uh, just just to uh, take a couple of steps back on the um, the optimism part with uh, Asian Africa, that has a lot to do uh, with the fact that, um, uh, as the saying goes, it's the second guy who buys the hotel who makes the money. Uh, it's they, they get to leapfrog, as you know. Uh, they're not sitting on uh, on obsolete and uh, on legacy and, and legacy technology. And, uh, and they're bypassing, for example, landlines. And there's areas where there's no lines. You know, you know how it is. Okay. It's a story in, in, in India. And, uh, and the role it had not only in terms of um, uh, liberating and enabling uh, economic prosperity, but also um, empowering women in these exact areas where mm -hmm. they have been uh, known to be, uh, let's say, not, not, not at the time, um, uh, major contributors to their economy. So that's what you're seeing, this kind of fresh thrust forward. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all metrics say that there's always improvement when you see that happen. Now, when we talk about currents, it's interesting to be in the middle of all of that because, um, as you know, regardless of uh, policy making, technology is disruptive. That is, regardless of any ironclad, anything you throw at it, there's going to be a technology that comes in and essentially obliterates through any of these firewalls and connect everyone with everyone all over again. We've seen that happen time and time again. So, you know, as the topic of uh, techno-nationalism, it's going to be interesting to see this uh, multilateral multipolar approach to world governance, which is now um, uh, the seat of power happens to, do, happens to be with who owns these, uh, these deep technologies that are coming from the fourth industrial revolution, it's gonna be interesting to see how that pans out. Now we play neutral, so we're friends with everyone. Uh, of course, I'm a private person, so I don't speak for Qatar government, but uh, I speak as a, as a Qatari who lives here and, uh, and worked for the government in the past. And, uh, and the idea that um, we can connect dots that have previously been broken because of, uh, uh, let's say, short-term or misguided policies that, are, that, that have disconnected several, na several nations, is I see that as an opportunity. So, uh, so when you look at uh, access to uh, the East, and when we talked about Huawei, well, uh, uh, Qatar does, is one of the countries that uses Huawei technology. Um, uh, that spat between uh, U.S. and China is between U.S. and China. Uh, Qatar uh, plays no role in that. 
the idea is to look at uh, 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 technology with the same cynicism across the board. You mentioned mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. that, and uh, and make a judgment call based on what uh, uh, what what we want to do, and how does that align with our ambitions going forward? It's a um, it's a pendulum that is swinging. Uh, I don't see it ever settling because it goes from uh, uh, the, as the aspect of policy being multi multi many steps behind technology advancement is the reason why you see this type of protectionism that kicks in. And then after that, once things settle, then openness comes back. And then again, we swing back and forth there. So it's interesting to be in the middle of it. It's interesting to see how it all pans out. Um, no, let, let me put you on the spot here. Okay. Uh, there are a few other countries who thought they would connect the dots. But both sides are now asking them to choose sides. My worry is that I think that space to be in the middle is shrinking. Countries are being now asked more directly, sometimes even coercively. You, you saw the spat in Germany that I started this particular conversation with. Both the US and the Chinese are determined that Germany will take a stand in their favor. Now, do you worry that countries which are now beginning to see the bountiful benefits of technology will see a retarded, stunted growth around the technology sector because they will have to make a choice. Well, in, 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 in general, the, um, uh, any, uh, uh, let's say, nationalistic protectionist approach to uh, uh, solving humanity's deepest technological challenges will have a stunting effect on development. We've seen that, I mean, let's go back to uh, stem, stem cell research, we mm -hmm. had to call regenerative medicine. You can see the impact of that. Intellectual property regimes and export e control e rules. Export control rules, yeah. which yeah. are very archaic and, mm -hmm. and still from Cold War era uh, protections. Um, HP calculator chips used on rocket, rocket ships and uh, 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 military rockets and so forth. But um, uh, in the long term, so if you say, okay, p uh, choosing sides, I see that primarily, uh, uh, you know, when you, t when you talk about the, the tech development cycle of 25, 30 mm -hmm. year cycles, mm -hmm. I don't see that as an issue in that long span. I see that an issue in the short term. In the long term, you look at Qatar, what, it's, what it has done, it has established infrastructure for long term, sustained uh, uh, scientific research, innovation, and tech development. And the proof of that is the nine of the world leading academic institutions established here they wouldn't have established here if, uh, if uh, there would be a fickle policy regarding what, 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 uh, what Qatar is going to do. As a matter of fact, I was involved in at least uh, three of these institutions bringing them here, and there were many questions about how serious Qatar is, and, and there was many doubts about how uh, we would be able, because, you know, these institutions How many are, of these nine institutions are non-American? Or, or, or non-European American, non-Atlantic institutions. Well, these nine, no, they're, they're all they're all because you, yeah, we have we have uh, European and American institutions. Um, I think that is a beginning. I don't think that that stops us from uh, from reaching out to other institutions. Mm. Uh, Qatar is not has not chosen uh, uh, primarily because of the West. We went. It was a simple matter of go to these top inst that what's the listing for the top academic institutions of the world in terms of research, research spending, research output and pick the top three and go ask them to come and establish. It was simple as that. So, uh, so if uh, there were active institutions from outside of, of these countries that made these, made these top three, we would have approached them too. Let me ask you another question that this region is currently grappling with, and the, the, the Middle East, South Asia, uh, the larger Asian continent, it's around regime stability and what is technology doing to the old systems of governance, government selection, gov governance perpetu perpetuation. Is there a fear that too open a technology ecosystem is going to undermine uh, the degree of uh, stability in the region that governments are comfortable with? And, is, and how is Qatar approaching that? Because you seem to be investing in, in everything that seems to be moving the society towards far more liberal leanings um, in a region which is not necessarily uh, uh, done too well with those systems in the past. No, it's... it's um I can't speak for, for the other countries, but I can speak for mine. And um, I can tell you that uh, uh, I, I, led the, uh, I led the Qatar Science Technology Park Thrust and, uh, and was part of this, the Qatar Foundation Education City, and, and, and there have been conversations like this. I can tell you for a fact that uh, Qatar as a whole is actually embracing this, uh, uh, this, uh, this eye-opening knowledge gain that we would have. 
and the understanding that with that in parallel comes, comes the thirst and desire for self-expression and self-governance. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it was more about embracing that inevitable future rather than, uh, uh, rather than saying, no, we need to put controls because we want to maintain status quo. So it was at least my experience, I've seen the opposite of that, is that that's what's coming and let's make sure that everybody's eyes are open and they are fully And informed. governments and governance responds to that new impulse and trend. That's right. And, and key here is that, is that the population is, is, uh, is um, well connected, well aware uh, uh, and understands what, what, what issues that they're actually tackling. So then that's why there's been enormous investments in education infrastructure in Qatar. It's for that reason. It is to say, okay, we need to have a well-educated population because with a well-educated population that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that is sitting in an infrastructure that can enable them to express themselves will come automatically fantastic self-governance. And that's why you are investing in the much broader rubric of the fourth IR, including the knowledge institutions. Uh, Professor Wong, let me come back to you. Um, you, you heard uh, our, our speaker from Qatar and Rachel, and I think both of them have expressed um, a clear uh, dimension that China is struggling to uh, satisfy many of its partners around, which is that expression, freedom of expression, the openness, the more liberal societies that technology uh, was supposed to promote is not a Chinese offering. China does far better in surveillance tech, in, in tech that suppresses people, controls people, rather than it does, uh, uh, other, you know, uh, uh, versus technologies that have allowed people to express themselves. Now, is that something uh, which is again um, a wrong perception and misunderstanding, or, or is China changing that as well? Uh, I. I uh, thanks for uh, this uh, uh, question. I would like to uh, make like two uh, uh, responses, two points. Uh, first, well, I think it's uh, I think it's absolutely there's a, it's a very uh, typical stereotype sort of mis uh, uh, perception about what uh, uh, you know China is about and what the technology uh, is, is 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 making China to make or uh, changing China. And in fact, this is what the a lot of the Western media, they are narrative uh, about China. But if you live in China or if you visit China and you stay uh, extended period of time and engaging uh, with uh, the people, including young people on daily basis, you'll be amazed at how uh, the technology have changed. Uh, people give people this freedom of expression. For instance, I'll just give you one uh, example. It actually has both domestic and uh, global implications. Uh, the uh, international version of that is called TikTok. Mm -hmm. It's extremely popular in India, you know, in many parts of Asia, United States, many parts of the world. And it has its domestic... You have made lunatics out of us all with TikTok. I mean, India yeah, is TikTok, the best. TikTok, 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 TikTok. Uh, it's originally from the Chinese version. And then they had this international version. Okay. It's called TikTok. It's enabled... Hunt, I would say tens, hundreds of millions of ordinary people, you know, whether regardless of you live in a big city like Beijing or Shanghai, you are in a rural area, you can express yourself with a very, very low, just cheap cost. You cell phone connect to in that, you can express yourself. And, and this is the culture. I think it's now happening in China mm -hmm. and it's changing mm -hmm. China in a fundamental way. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is that really we have to be, as a scholar, you know, we have to be very uh, careful, skeptical about those kind of stereotype, very sort of rigid uh, and uh, a portrayal of China, especially I think that's getting back to my previous point. So, so we need to remove those uh, ideological prejudices to arrive at a, a more balanced understanding of China. And it's my second point, I also want to quickly, I want to know that. So what is the real problem here? I think the real problem is actually, it's, it's, it's because I think there's naturally a tension between technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis like consumer, right? It's, for instance, I've got American friend who told me that, you know, we actually have to, in contemporary world, we have to live and act under an assumption that all those apps, all those technologies and actually watching us 20, Seven. So, so how many of you got this experience? If you read, just read a news about Doha Forum, and, and next minute, minute you will uh, pop up a travel an advertisement about travel agency promoting tourism, you know, going to Doha. 
who is watching you? It's algorithm, right? It's AI. It's automatically. So, so I think, and 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 the, and the thing that uh, what the policymaker will ha have to do is that to develop a regulatory uh, policy framework or regime that can strike a balance between the protection of um, uh, 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 consumer privacy and uh, and vis-a-vis and -vis, you know, social welfare, or if you want to add also national but, security but, but, as well. But Professor Wong, this is where the problem comes. China says that it is the job of the government to make this regime. Other countries say that it has to be a multi-stakeholder process with yeah. civil society, academics, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and the yeah. international community, community part yeah. of that decision making. Yeah. Sure, I, I think this is another you know uh, point I actually wanted to uh, uh, add is that uh, there are a lot of misunderstanding, oversimplified uh, picture understanding about what the policy making process uh, is in China, and uh, and I think I actually would uh, would argue that the policy deliberation process in China, in many ways, it's it you can call it a, it's a, a consultative or consultation involves multi uh, layers of uh, consultation process involving consultation with, with experts, you know, with different social groups. And uh, you know, there's, uh, they have this, uh, uh, the Chinese version of uh, CPP, Chinese, mm -hmm. you know, uh, People's uh, Political Consultation Conference, right? And, and uh, a lot of those uh, policy deliberation and discussion debate and being held. But the problem is that I think, you know, again, going back to this uh, ideological prejudice and stereotypes, I think a lot of the, the Western narrative about China really missed that picture. And I feel very, I think that's very unfortunate. This is something I think the, uh, the discussion, conversation like this one, uh, we are having now, we need to really uh, uh, sort of at least make a correction to that and, uh, and try to understand uh, China as it is rather than as it has been uh, mistakenly sort of uh, represented in the West media. Rachel, how real is the threat of a digital cold war? Do you think we are now moving towards splinter net, the, world, the digital world fragmented, China tech, Euro tech, American tech, eventually an India tech, a GCC tech, we move from oil to tech. I mean, I think that, I don't know that I would call it a digital cold war, um, but I think that we are going toward a world where, um, you know, the internet is going to be fragmented and it is going to look different in different places, right? And, and this is where th this idea of like multilateral regulation becomes really difficult, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have a, uh, you know, you want to have rules of the road that people follow and, and just basic laws and basic tenets that govern the area of, you know, cyberspace and, and the internet. But obviously, sovereign nations are going to have a very different view of what that looks like and how they protect their own interests and how they interact in what is a global, um, you know, a global space. Um, I mean, for so example, there are voices from Europe and America which mm -hmm. are saying that TikTok should be banned. But they never, and they were the same people who used to evangelize the right of Facebook and all other platforms emanating from the West to be present. Sure, that's true. And but this is the, this is the difficult thing about TikTok, right? Is um, it it comes down to you know the, the parent company, right, ByteDance, and and the 2017 Chinese uh, cybersecurity law. Is our data safe with, with TikTok? Is American users' data safe with, with that company? And I think the answer to that question is maybe at best and absolutely not at worst, right? But coming back to a, you know, a fragmented internet, a, a sort of a splinter net, um, I think that we are seeing that today. And the, you know, the question is how do each of these, um, you know, these different views uh, whether like it's a, co a cosmopolitan uh, internet sovereignty, the, the, you know, GCC, uh, Europe, GDPR, how do they all interact together while protecting their interests but still allowing the free flow of opinion and information? And these are questions that I think we're answering today. And because we don't have, you know, because information has, has um, you know, exploded at a, at a pace that is just astronomical, um, it's almost developing faster than we can develop um, rules of the road for it. We're sort of building the airplane as we fly it, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, like you mentioned, these are, these are big questions that I think we're, we're dealing with today, and 
we don't have answers quite yet. You want to make a quick intervention? Yeah, yeah. Quick uh, uh, two-finger intervention. I, I just want to add to uh, Richard's excellent uh, uh, comments by noting that the localization of data is actually is not just like China's policy. Many other, including you know India, many other uh, uh, countries are actually promoting and and for understandable reasons. So so I think for you know I I I don't know exactly the real policy of TikTok, but my understanding that they would have to work or meet the local, any legal requirement, for instance, uh, if they operate in India, if India come up with such kind of law, they have to, of course, have to comply with that. And, and that's how you make sure that, you know, there's no uh, such kind of uh, concern about, about security, about, about, about data. So, so I think uh, uh, that's how you can compete and, uh, uh, in the global market. Otherwise, uh, and, and I think that's naturally will help us us reduce this anxiety about, oh, you know, whether that, that really gonna happen. It's, it's not gonna happen because it will be filtered by this local legal So you framework. are saying local laws will eventually shape That's uh, intervening, operations. extremely important intervening variable. So we have to So let me ask Khaled by your question. Let me ask you Khaled a question. That um, you're an investor. Now, how does an investor operate in this ecosystem? You have built a product which will have a different set of laws in China, a different set of rules in India, a different set of norms in Europe. How does an investor make that decision? Where does Qatar put its money? How do you, uh, in a sense, uh, work around the regulatory uncertainty due to the differential regimes? Yeah, fragmentation, for sure, is, um, is a challenge for any investor uh, because investors look for unified large markets uh, like the United States, European Union, uh, China, and um, uh, in my time working in tech since, uh, since the late 80s, uh, I've seen transformative things happen along the way. But even today, you, you talk to VCs in the Valley and they're, they're not as interested in, uh, in, in, in businesses that, that span in, in fragmented markets. They're happy just like, okay, if you've got a US, a US economy-based business plan, mm -hmm. that's good enough and we can run with that. So, uh, so indeed, um, it's also the main challenge of the Middle East market because it is, it is fragmented. Correct. While it's a very, very, very large market, um, it's all over the place when it, when it comes to doing that. But I'd like to uh, take a couple of steps back and uh, if you allow me, and, and not as much focus on, let's say, the, the data protectionism aspect of technationalism. It's more about development of artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, space, uh, space technologies, which are, which are huge, massive, uh, challenges that require investments that not one single country can actually pull off, and space is a great example of that. Uh, humans are far from, let's say, reaching any pinnacle of any of any technology revolution where we keep reinventing ourselves, and it just keeps the more the more uh, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know, and and we keep going that, down that path. Uh, any any fragmentation uh, only slows this down, and we have this pixie dust that uh, that belongs to a few handful of countries called hydrocarbon resources. Mm -hmm that we are reliably burning uh, to advance our, our agenda. If, we don't, if we're not careful about using that pixie dust uh, well in order to get us past the point where we need it, then just like a ball rolling all the way back from the top of the mountain, it's gonna roll all the way back down. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna lose our ability to be able to continue as a population that busts through 12 billion people in the, in the earth. So uh, as a country that's investing in the knowledge age, building institutions, building the human resources for tomorrow. Why is it that we don't see enough leadership from India, Qatar, and other countries which are betting on the fourth industrial revolution in terms of setting the global agenda? Why are we not using this opportunity to put together a proposition that makes both the Americans and the Chinese agree to a normative framework? Why is it that the the countries whose future depends on it are not investing in the policy and political questions of our time. I, I agree with you. I think that um, it's possible for a country as small as Qatar to punch above its weight, and it's certainly doing that, and uh, the Doha Forum is an example of that, uh, and it's, uh, it's the place where we can have this kind of dialogue, and uh, Qatar says this is the venue, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, out of that comes uh, uh, movements towards leader leadership positions. I think for, for cut, India, of course, is, is large, but it has a, a, a challenging economic, management of economy issue, if you want to put it uh, in a mildly. 
we uh, like to create that for ourselves we like it that way there is there is that aspect and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's an ancient uh, ancient and fantastic uh, fantastic uh, culture that that uh, that uh, is uh, modernizing at a rapid pace but it's still not as well felt with qatar you know we are a small country and getting the word out there is hard for a small country it's uh, uh, we, you know, when, when, you, when you have the big guys uh, around us, they look at us like, well, this tiny, wealthy Arab country, you know, they've got a lot of money and, and, and they're happy spending it. But I can tell you that being in the trenches here, uh, some of the best research in, in, uh, in say, natural language understanding mm -hmm. uh, is based worldwide, is, 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 based, is, is yeah. produced here. Mm -hmm. uh, although not yet fully felt because it's still in the realm of research and development. I, I came back after 22 years of living in the United States um, uh, primarily for family and uh, to be back home, but also to participate in what's coming in Qatar. This uh, thriving, now you look at the city of Doha, for, most, for many of you it's the first time to be here. You, I'm sure you're surprised to see this, uh, th this metropolis type. I think it's idea. in Qatar where data will be the new oil for sure. The, everyone uses the term data as oil, but for countries who are typically moving their economies to this new direction. I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example. I, I, I uh, helped form and sat on the National ICT Strategy Committee back in 2001 that has set the tone for what you see in terms of ICT here. We were nowhere. We're not even close. We have 45 megabit connection for the whole country. And uh, within a few simple months, and we brought um, uh, the well-known uh, uh, Dr. Raj Reddy uh, to be mm -hmm. with us on the, on the, on the, on the committee, Within a few months, we made wide-sweeping recommendations that we would connect everyone with everyone. This is 2001, 2002, everyone, everyone with fiber. And in that, in that year, they became mandate, they became, that became law. And that's why Doha is one of the most connected cities on mm -hmm. earth. And we roll out, we're the first to roll out 5G. So then when it comes to embracing the future uh, of, uh, of information, um, you, when you think that this thought process existed in this tiny country some 20 years ago, is phenomenal, right? So that when you're in the trenches, you'll see these types Correct. of things. Correct, you see the change. I'm going to come to you. I'm, I want to pick up a few um, interventions from all of you. I can see a hand there, and don't feel shy. There's a hand here. Uh, and, okay, so I have three, three uh, interventions this, uh, for this round, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to come back for the second one. So the gentleman at the back, the lady here, and the lady in front. Oh, there are four of you. So let's take all four of you. I don't know whether we'll be able to come back. I just looked at my watch. So let's take all of you. Do introduce yourself, and if you want to direct it to any one of the panelists, please identify them. Okay, my, my name is Bilal Saber. Thank you very much for this nice discussion. I would like to ask uh, Professor Dong and um, all the panel, if they could also. Um, do you think it's possible, you know, with the, in, in the light of the new revolution, industrial revolution, do you think where, where technology now is getting deep into our humanity, do you think it's possible to uh, divorce technology from values? Mm. Is it, is it mm. possible to, if we have completely different value systems, um, to have one technology? Um, and um, regarding the point that uh, Professor Dong mentioned about the reality in China compared to the Western, um, you know, stereotypic, how, how does that apply to, say, um, the Muslims in China, you know, the, um, how free to express themselves using technology are they, for example, and whatever, you know. So, so I think there are issues with, um, I, I just want to stop here. And, I, I, and, I, I, and, we've got your questions. And, technology and value and, and access to technology for certain groups within nations. I think that's the question you asked, the lady here. We'll just move uh, in front and then we'll come to you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. Can um, you introduce yourself? Yes, sorry. Uh, Joyce Hackme from Chatham House. Uh, my first question is to Professor Dong, and you mentioned the importance of addressing the real problem. And I'd like to take the question on 5G a little bit outside the trade talk and the misconceptions that we talked about in this session. Um, the UK um, Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Center is an initiative that started a few years back, which is meant to address the security issues with the Huawei kit. And from a purely security point of view, regardless of who, where Huawei um, is coming from or, you know, whether it's part of Chinese government or not, the report uh, in last April had, had different findings. And I want to point out to the most important one in my views is that it said that the concerns that were uh, identified in the previous report have not been addressed at all by Huawei. So my question to you is, 
um, as an academic looking into these issues is Huawei uh, compromising security uh, for, um, you know, for, for market access and for dominance in that space. And uh, I have a question, it's a bit un un unconventional to the chair. You talked about um, a nice term, I think, the tech optimism and how countries in between the swing states are meant to be choosing sides, whether a liberal approach or the sovereign approach. Um, in your views as the president of ORF, what do you think India, in which direction do you think India is heading, mm -hmm. and what sort mm -hmm. of impact would that have on its future? Thank you. Great. Uh, can we come here? There's a, there's a question here, and then I'll come to you at the back. Hello, I'm Yuan Li from the Netherlands, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. I have a question first to Professor Wang Dong. Uh, you mentioned that very often uh, Western media misunderstood China. I would like to ask you, I'm curious, is that also sometimes a reflection in China that sometimes our uh, me, uh, Chinese media also misunderstand uh, uh, Western? And I have a question to Raphael. Uh, well, talk about Huawei, how the United States reacted and how China reacted in terms of uh, Germany in the middle. So we now how we get here. And my question to you is, do you, can, uh, can you give some ideas how you think we can get out of here? Okay, uh, and the final intervention, oh, okay, two quick interventions uh, on, on my right here. Yeah, yeah. Can you bring, can someone get the mic here? Thanks. There are two interventions here. <coughs> and then we will come for the final word from each one of you, respond to any questions you want to. Those that are uncomfortable, you don't have to respond to. Go ahead. <laughs> Peter Coharis, um, international lawyer from Washington, D.C. I help foreign investors uh, often in emerging market countries, but I'm also an international human rights lawyer. And I'm going to let you off the hook, Professor, and talk about uh, how this notion of sovereignty and competing values, there's such a thing as universal human rights. At least I believe so, and I think the state of Qatar believes so. And so I want to talk about American companies not living up to those. It's, we saw Facebook and what happened with the Rohingya in Burma. We still have TVs that can spy on Americans as the FBI report recently came out. And while Twitter denounced the notion that uh, they would uh, allow people to purposefully lie and spread misinformation in the upcoming elections, Facebook has still said that political advertisements can lie through their teeth with no repercussions. So I'm, I'm going to let you off the hook, Professor, and talk about the... the uh, Corporate, corporate responses to human rights. And finally, can you just pass the mic behind you? Right here. Sorry, I, you, you were uh, uh, early in your, uh, you wanted an early intervention and my apologies. No, and you'll think we're tag teaming. I'm Peggy Hicks with the UN's Human Rights Office in Geneva. So um, I, the conversation earlier about where technology is going seemed to imply that, that something like concerns about human rights might be operated as sort of breaks um, and that might get in the way of some of the innovation that we'd like to see. And I wanted to challenge that idea and wonder if there, um, from the perspective of the panel, you see ways in which incorporating human rights by design will actually help mm. us mm. have better tech. And you can see that for exactly something like an algorithmic um, bias uh, issue, that in fact, if you want the best employees, you want it not to have bias written into it, right? So looking at those issues of how human rights can actually help us move uh, technological innovation forward. And then on the regulatory front, you talked a bit about the role of companies, and my colleague here has, has focused on that. One of the questions I had was about the ability to engage across the spectrum of companies. And, and I take your point about uh, the, the US companies and agree with it, um, but the reality is there is an active dialogue with those companies and there is a transparent approach to how, they're, how they are engaging on human rights issues and they've adopted commitments under the UN guiding principles. And I think we'd have a lot more level playing field and a lot better conversation if uh, Chinese companies and others would engage in that same level of conversation. Okay, so let me um, come back to all of you. Why don't you start with uh, uh, this question that um, has been posed by uh, the lady from the UN. Um, is rights by design, a business model by itself. 
technology that promotes, sustains, and, and strengthens individual freedoms and rights, is that a, a, a model that can be commercialized and, and, and actually be capitalized? Well, the second part of your question is yes. The first part depends on how we define business. So in the sense that, you know, the, the modern concept of business, especially when we talk in the, in the rubric of tech, this uh, Delaware C Corporation type of, uh, type of business, is a relatively modern phenomenon when it comes to commerce in general. You know, it's a couple of hundred years or so uh, uh, versus thousands of years of commerce. <clears throat> and throughout time, we have seen definition and redefinition of what, that, what it means from barter economy to fiat to uh, so-and-so. Um, so then uh, the modern understanding of business, and I've started some of, some of, these, some of these companies, is a very ruthless you know, profit above all as long as we don't... Uh, we don't barrel through uh, 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 red lines is fair game, and, mm. it, and and the human component doesn't matter. We leave it up to the uh, the um, uh, legislature to decide how to protect them. I don't subscribe to that. I actually much prefer uh, uh, the second part of your question, which is: it is is it actually? And the, the question that you asked: is it actually possible to weave in, um, let's say, uh, innate good human values uh, that translate into 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 human rights? and basic human rights into commerce and still have it thrive. And to me, it's, 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 a, it's as simple as looking at the numbers. When you look at um, the profit above, above all structures and the amount of uh, uh, income redistribution it has caused, where, where the, the very slim top echelon own a good portion, um, you can see that there's indeed a lot of room for people if they're not so greedy. You know, greed is not so good is not so greedy to be able to still enormously thrive while at the same time um, sleep, sleep well at night, let's put it that way. Well, uh, I'm, I'm one of few who believes that. Um, I think that it is possible, and you can see movements even in the United States with B corporations, which are, social, which are designed to be socially responsible. I, um, uh, I haven't formed one. I formed C corporations, which are simple corporate structures, and nonprofits, which of course have uh, a, a, a value-driven approach to what they do. Uh, but this middle ground of profit motive or the force of capital along with a coupling of, uh, of human values and human rights, I think it's, it's more than possible. And actually, it, it kind of answers the question that why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, if we keep this, um, this income redistribution to a point where it's not sustainable, it becomes a house of cards and everything collapses upon itself. At the end of the day, the majority of the world contributes, and if they cannot sustain themselves, then world productivity just comes to a grinding halt, and it may just collapse upon itself with widespread poverty, uh, uh, climate, uh, uh, climate disasters, and, 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 uh, and lack of uh, resources like basic resources like water. What I'd like to see is a, is a push in which we take full advantage of the resources we have today to, to collectively uh, tackle these challenges that we know we cannot tackle uh, separately and separate cocoons, including very, very large countries that have very, very large GDPs, and work towards that. Now, it sounds like a dream. It sounds like a lofty goal. Uh, but then if you, um, if you look at the, work, at the worker level, it's actually happening. You know, it, it happens all the way at the granular level that it's actually possible to integrate and go all the way to the top and make that happen and be successful. So that's my, that's my statement. Mm -hmm. uh, you had, a, I think, three questions directed to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I wanted, I'm glad that you brought up the issue of, of human rights and values because this is something that I, I was hoping to, to touch on. Um, you mentioned, you know, is it possible to divorce technology from values? Um, it shouldn't be. They're inexorably linked, and, and that's, that's uh, we should link them going forward, right? Um, you know, we talk a lot about Chinese technology and, and, um, and, and human rights abuses, but what I look at uh, also as an American living in, in Germany is um, European companies that export surveillance equipment to authoritarian states. You have companies based in Germany, based in Sweden, based in the United Kingdom, um, whose technologies were found in the hands of authoritarian leaders during the Arab Spring. Um, and so this is an issue that is pervasive throughout even Western democracies. And 
I think that having, you know, right now there's a debate going on at the EU level about updating this 2009 regulation on dual use exports, and there are people pushing for human rights language to be included in it. And you get a lot of pushback from states whose companies are based there. And, and it makes it really difficult to get human rights language in these regulations, but it is so important, and that's something that I think we should absolutely strive for and everyone should be pushing for. Um, no, and I'm going to ask you to hurry it up because I've been getting this. Yeah, sure. And then yeah. how are we going to get out of the, the 5G and Huawei debate? Um, probably not anytime soon, <laughs> but we can talk about that offline. Um, Professor Wong. Okay, I think I've got at least four uh, questions. Um, first, I actually... But rapid, rapid fire answers, quick answers. Quick, yeah, I'll, no more than one TikTok minute. TikTok type answers. All right, TikTok. Six, 60 seconds for each, all right. So I agree with uh, Rachel, I think we should not, uh, you know, divorce uh, technology value from technology, and uh, certainly I think this is uh, uh, actually one of the very big differences between machine, like AI, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis humankind, because, you, you know, there's uh, ethics that are really governing that. So, uh, but what I'm trying to argue in my previous comment is that try to avoid, you know, not bring this ideological prejudice into the conversation. That's very important, okay? But that's different from divorcing uh, uh, value from technology. Uh, and uh, we do hope that we, we uh, you know, the Muslim issue, that question, we probably need another panel uh, devoted to that discussion. But uh, let me just very quickly to say that it is a de-radicalization measures taken by uh, China. And uh, it's very unfortunately there's a lot of uh, demonization, a lot of sort of mistaken wrong uh, representation about what's really happening in China. Uh, so, but I think China also needs to, to, be, to be very frank, also needs to do a better job in telling its own uh, story. And as far as I understand, thousands of, uh, of uh, Western, uh, 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 like diplomats, uh, you know, uh, and uh, journalists, and, and has been invited to pay visit, uh, and, uh, and many of them actually, uh, you know, came away with a much more nuanced, better understanding. And I do hope at some point they, they could also extend invitation to you so that you can get a better sense uh, and, uh, about that. And secondly, UK, um, Huawei, of course, uh, they need to work very closely with UK and its counterparts to address any remaining concerns uh, if uh, they still have not been uh, uh, resolved. I think that's, but, but my point, I think, uh, the thing I want to say that, to be very fair, to be fair to Huawei, I think Huawei is already much more transparent than many, many of its peers. I think that's, that's also something we have to acknowledge. Um, yes, uh, Professor Lee, certainly uh, China, Many mutual misunderstanding. China also misunderstand uh, West a lot. That's why we need a dialogue, conversation, as, and also, uh, 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 as Samir says, a very important part of my job is promoting this people-to-people -people exchange conversation. Uh, try to correct that. Uh, and lastly, I want to say that yes, uh, universal human rights, but we also have to bear in mind universal human rights doesn't equal to the Western definition of human, right, uh, human rights. I think that's also something very, very important. I think at least, for instance, China has made... So, so uh, I think you made your point. Yeah. I'm going to have to uh, close the session. I want to make three observations as I close it. I think you make a point, a valid point okay. around value, both of you. Yeah. The first, I think the gentleman's question was there are documents all of us have signed as a global right. community <clears throat> around human rights. Can those be embedded within the framework of technology? And I think the answer is yes, yeah. because we have signed the documents. Second, uh, uh, you asked me a question on what kind of a choice would India make, uh, swinging between these various. I don't think India will be a swing state. I think India will be its own state. I think it is exhibiting dual characteristics. In some senses, it is more China-like. In many other, it is more uh, uh, cosmopolitan. I don't think the Indian debate on this subject is over yet. I, I hope we become a cosmopolitan digital society, but the jury is out on that. And finally, uh, I think uh, as we close this, um, individuals have more agency to influence the politics of technology than ever before. The, the mobile in your hand allows you to join the debate anytime. And I think it is our job as users to continue to, continue to defy regimes that seek to take away our expression and our privacy. So I think the battle will be fought by us. May each of you use your mobile phone well today. Thank you very much for joining us. Join me in applauding the panel.